you know, perhaps uh, the rules haven't been followed closely, but these are at the margin. Uh, and I think that it's, um, you know, quite positive that uh, nothing's been revealed in terms of a, a, an endemic or structural problem with our, with our financial sector. So I think it's still going to be largely local factors and uh, local factors are certainly working in favour of the Brisbane market. Um, as Graham mentioned, um, you know, Brisbane's become uh, flavour of the month again, South East Queensland's flavour of the month. Net migration uh, numbers are the strongest they've been since 2005. Interstate migration now is the strongest since 2005, and um, clearly ahead of any of the other the other states. And um, in fact, uh, New South Wales has is losing people at a net rate similar to what uh, Queensland is gaining them. And I, I don't think we'd be terribly surprised given all those affordability advantages, particularly in the Brisbane market uh, and lifestyle and the growing economy. So ticking a lot of boxes and I wouldn't be too worried about the Royal Commission, Rob. Excellent, thank you, Andrew, appreciate that. Our next question is for Michael Corianis. So Michael, what do investors need to be aware of in investing in the property markets right now? It's a good question, Rob, thanks for asking. The main thing I think you always need to be aware of is the supply and demand dynamics that underpin any market. At the end of the day, for me personally, I think that is the core aspect that drives markets. If you have more people wanting to live in the same place, they will pay more for it and it's the highest bidder wins. That's pretty much it in a nutshell. If you can immerse yourself in the data and the factors that affect that, like my other two esteemed panellists, they've referred to some of those aspects. For me, those pieces of data help you to understand what the underlying supply and demand dynamics are for any particular property, particular area or particular region. And there's all kinds of sectors and subsectors within that. And that's really the challenge, is getting to understand the interplay of the factors that affect that very broad reference to a supply and demand dynamic. Very good, thank you, Michael. Uh, next question is for Russell Spark. Russell, given that the, the upcoming changes to the GST legislation which are coming into effect on the 1st of July next week, what do you see are the impacts, I guess, on uh, new purchases in the residential market, uh, especially in the legal side of things? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, the, cert the property industry certainly is facing some challenges. I mean, we already have the uh, additional foreign acquirer uh, duty. We have uh, capital gains withholding. Uh, obligations on buyers and now as you said we have the new GST withholding uh, regime about to come into existence so what that's going to mean for buyers and sellers is an increasing burden of uh, compliance and uncertainty so the the new GST rules will make the buyers liable to collect the uh, GST payable on new residential premises or for potential residential land so uh, buyers and sellers are going to have to be very careful to identify uh, whether that is going to apply. So uh, the, uh, the buyers will have to remit the GST and for, for the first time since GST was introduced, uh, the GST payable on new residential premises and, and land will be identifiable. So that will be uh, the first opportunity that people will be able to compare apples for apples in the market uh, with the GST. The, um, there was also going to be strict compliance and also penalties on the buyers. So there seems to be an, an ever-increasing uh, uh, trend towards targeting buyers for compliance and collection of revenue uh, from sellers and that sort of thing. So, yeah. Challenging times ahead. And I, I think the next six months we'll see that play out uh, as to how successfully we're able to transition to that. So thank you very much for that. Lord Mayor. Why are you building the Brisbane Metro and what advantages will that provide to the City of Brisbane? Yeah, look, this is a, an interesting question because traditionally in any other part of Australia, um, projects like this would be handled by a state government. But because of our size, uh, we're able to, as a local authority, um, undertake a project of this sort. No one else has a plan to do it and we know it needs to be done, so we decided we would step up to the plate. It, it is a $944 million project. Uh, we've recently been given a guarantee of $300 million from the federal government. Uh, it's passed the Infrastructure Australia test as a priority project in the nation. And so what it is is a two lines. It's one from the Royal Brisbane Women's Hospital at Hurston to the University of Queensland. And the other one goes from Roma Street to Eight Mile Plains to the High Technology Park out that way. 
So along the route, um, it will have a three minute frequency in the peak periods, five minutes off peak every 10 minutes at night. It'll run 24 hours a day on weekends and it'll run around 19 to 20 hours from Sunday to Thursday night. So that's good from a public transport user's perspective, but it's also much more than that because Metro is also about creating a high frequency link to be able to form employment clusters. So we have emerging health and medical services. There's hospitals and medical research institutions along that corridor. There's a number of educational institutions and student accommodation on the corridor. So we've got the education link. There's knowledge-based industries, creative sectors, and importantly, advanced technology sectors as well. So it's, it's about certainly high frequency public transport, but also uh, it's about those employment opportunities. But beyond that, uh, it frees up uh, a number of buses, and that means that we can increase and improve services across other parts of the city as well. Excellent. Exciting times ahead and makes me wish I was living on the route. Um, Dr Wilson, next question for you. Are interest rates going to rise in the medium to short term? Uh, look, there's absolutely no prospect uh, of interest rates rising in the foreseeable future. In fact, I'm a little bit of an outlier on this. I think there's even a chance we might get a cut in interest rates uh, you know, sooner rather than later. How's that for a, a shock? But um, look, our economy is doing okay generally, but a lot of it's being generated by uh, a strong export performance. Uh, consumption is still quite low. Um, and uh, the last thing, you know, consumers would require, would need, would be, a, would be higher interest rates. We did have higher interest rates uh, impact our housing markets over the past year through the financial regulator. Uh, they've now stepped back and said that they're not going to be interfering, thankfully, in market dynamics going forward. Um, we do have, unfortunately, the spectre of um, uh, perhaps a trade war, a global trade war. Uh, Australia is a strong exporter. Again, we may need to have to ease monetary policy to uh, keep our export industries competitive. Um, so, look, really, the, uh, the case for higher interest rates is as remote as it's been. Let's remember, we've had interest rates on hold now for nearly two years. That's a record period. And the last time we had an interest rate increase uh, was over seven years ago, and that's also a record period. And those that like to sort of get the attention of everybody with the uh, scary old story that interest rates are going to rise soon, even they're backing off now and saying that uh, at the very earliest interest rates would increase at the end of next year. So relax, uh, get used to what's going to be a very long period, in my opinion, of low, uh, low interest rate, uh, low interest rate uh, activity. And uh, I think that's good news for the property market because we can sort of get on with uh, buying and selling without worrying about that uh, age-old question, is it a good time to buy or sell? Okay, Rob? Excellent news. Glad to hear. <laughs> yeah, I can see you're relieved. <laughs> Very good. So, Michael, next question for you. You're a large proponent of a, a thing called buffer uh, investing and value capital. Can you tell me a little bit about what that means and what that might mean to any potential investors? Most of the time when you invest, your money's immediately exposed to market movements. If you invest in the share market and the share market goes down, you lose money straight away. We've got $2.6 trillion at the moment in superannuation in this country, and Dr. Wilson will probably back me up here, the majority of that is exposed to shares. The funny thing is, we've seen a nine year bull run in markets. The US markets are way up on their highs. They're way above their historic moving averages. And that's likely to come down, in my opinion, and likely to come down in the short term. And that's probably the greatest challenge that we face to things like our property prices and just all manner of things financial, really. Now, I don't think it's going to be an Armageddon situation. I'm not a doomsayer. But I do believe that the pullback could easily be of the order of 20 to 25 percent or more. And there's a lot of really high profile commentators. Some of the people I follow regularly are people like Roger Montgomery and Hamish McDouglas. Um, Roger Montgomery from, from Montgomery Investments and Hamish McDouglas from Magellan. And these guys have been calling this for quite some time. I think they're right. We obviously can't control when that will happen or if it will happen. It just seems that the only reason it won't happen is if history doesn't repeat itself this time. So if history repeats itself, it's near enough a certainty, in my opinion. 
One of the ways that you insulate yourself against that is by creating value. The old buy and hold approaches, buy and hold stocks and hope, buy and hold property and hope, lock you in to market cycles and there's nothing you can do to control those market cycles. They're ruled by forces that are way outside your control. So my approach over several years, I used to be a financial advisor for a long time and I was always challenged by this, that people would give me their money and I couldn't control in many respects how well that money did or didn't do. And one of the ways that I realized over my journey was that if you could control the value creation process, you created a buffer for people. And the buffer was that value. There's, if you're taking, it's, you're essentially manufacturing, you're taking a raw material and turning it into something more valuable. So if you engage yourself in that process, you've engineered value in. And if the market goes against you, you have a, a very significant buffer, depending on how much value you can create, that you have to go through before you hit a break even position. Excellent, thank you, appreciate that. Uh, next question for Russell, again back on that controversial GST withholding tax, uh, what do you see are the implications with regards to the conveyancing and settlement process, particularly on people uh, at an event like this where looking at a lot of buy and hold type uh, scenarios, some impacts in the settlement and conveyancing? Certainly. Um, so from the uh, service provider's point of view, there will be an ever increasing amount of compliance. So from a, from a seller's point of view, they're going to be required to identify the amount of GST that they're going to have to pay. So that's either going to be 1 11th or if they're using the margin scheme, it's been uh, set at 7%. Um, the, I've seen the new amendments that are proposed to the REIQ contract that's coming out on the 1st of July. Um, those declarations will be in there and the, uh, the sellers and buyers will also have to warrant that they, uh, those things are true. The, uh, the GST regime will not apply to commercial properties. Uh, it won't apply to options. Uh, but it will apply to potential residential land, but not where it's being bought by, say, a developer or a building contractor that's, buying, that's registered for GST and is also buying it for a creditable purpose, which is, uh, say, building houses or townhouses in the uh, ordinary course of their business. So from a, from a buyer's point of view, what they're going to have to do under the new contract is lodge forms with the ATO. First of all, they're going to have to lodge all the details of the seller and the buyer, and they'll obtain payment reference, uh, lodgement reference numbers and payment reference numbers, and they also have to notify the ATO of the date of uh, settlement. They have to then give those forms to the seller, and then the seller has to, if they haven't already done so, before settlement, identify the amount of GST that the, uh, the buyer will have to pay. Then the regime around settlement will be uh, the contract, well, the, the legislation actually states that the payment has to be made to the uh, Deputy Commissioner of Taxation, but the new contract will state that the buyer has to draw a cheque payable and hand that over to the seller and direct the seller to pay that to the Commissioner. So once that's paid, the seller, the buyer will be relieved of having to pay that amount of money and the, the seller will get a credit when they put their bass in. So from the, from the seller's point of view, there's going to be a hole in their cash flow, particularly if they've got uh, quarterly basses and they do a settlement and they might have had the opportunity to have the benefit of that, that GST until they had to pay their bass. That money will no longer be... Uh, uh, available to them. Most developers will probably be on monthly basis so they can uh, claim back their input tax credits, uh, but uh, certainly there'll be a lot more compliance there. So from our point of view as lawyers and conveyances, there will be uh, a lot more work to do, a lot more liability, and there'll be a lot, uh, the, the agents, the sellers and buyers will be relying upon the lawyers to get it right. So ultimately it, the, it will have to increase the cost of, of conveyancing because of the added uh, amount of work. So. Yeah, I guess a, a quite a convoluted process from uh, all accounts of what I've heard, and quite expensive if you get repercussions if you get it wrong. So, uh, highly encourage that you, you put your homework in in going through that new purchasing process. One other, one other thing, one of the traps will be instalment contracts, and the legislation actually states that the GST will be payable upon the first payment other than deposit. So if you've got a genuine deposit payable, and then I've thought of situations where developers actually get payments from buyers for to do uh, variation works or extras and things like that. So the first time that a payment other than the deposit is made, the obligation to pay the GST arises, and that might be well before settlement. Uh, could be months and the problem will be funding that or, or dealing with that situation. 
Yeah, especially if a bank is uh, not willing to, to forward that cash until, unless and until such time as they actually have title, uh, can be challenging. Yes. Lord Mayor, in your opinion, uh, you're trying to position Brisbane as a leisure and lifestyle city. What are some of the initiatives that you've done within the city of Brisbane to, to actually engage that? Yeah, well, look, uh, I think that is the case. I mean, we've got this great natural advantage of climate here in Brisbane, and um, we are uh, more and more about uh, creating a leisure and lifestyle city. It uh, plays to our advantage, if you like. I mean, some of the things that we've got on the go at the moment is uh, the, looking at the construction of a zip line. Uh, at Mount Coother. We've got a number of projects uh, on the go there, for example. So South Bank is our, is our biggest attractor. It's our biggest leisure area, if you like, in the city. But Mount Coother is number two. And uh, we've done improvements to walking trails up there. We've just opened a new visitor information centre at the Botanic Gardens. Um, we've got uh, JC Slaughter Falls and Simpsons Falls, where we're undertaking $2 million upgrades to each of those. Um, so the whole precinct up there will, on completion, see the establishment of a Kutha shuttle, which will link all the various attractions, the, the planetarium, which is your astronomical experience, through to the walking trails, the parkland, and indigenous experience we will start up there. Um, and then there's the river. So. Uh, we are, I think, underutilising our river. We're a river city, and so what we're trying to do at the moment is establish a number of river activation hubs. And we're talking here about, for example, the potential to go from the centre of the city out to Morton Bay or to Morton Island, Stradbroke Island, um, and a number of those are in the pipeline. The first will be completed, which will be at New Farm, just near the powerhouse at New Farm Park. Uh, there's others at West End, at Dutton Park, and, um, and a couple around the South Bank area. So we would like the opportunity for people to be able to come in, um, you know, moor their tinny or, or boat, whatever it might be, through to a, a craft of some sort and go to a restaurant or alternatively, again, go to, out to the bay. But it can be canoes or, or anything. Can I just close on, on one point, uh, Rob, on Absolutely. this one? Um, very recently there was a a study out called Creating Great Australian Cities. It was undertaken by a group in London called The Business of Cities, of Professor Greg Clark. Um, this was a study of around 350 cities across the globe. And in that, in the last three years, it's got Brisbane progressing from 56th place to 36th place on that list of cities. During that same period, uh, Melbourne has improved one position. Sydney has remained static. Now I say that for no other reason than to suggest that uh, leisure and lifestyle is a part of the component of these assessments. There's many others, there's innovation and a whole lot of other things, but it does show again that Brisbane is a city that is on the move and another reason why investment here is a good opportunity. And another reason why we all like living here. So thank you, Lord Mayor. Absolutely. Dr. Wilson. Yes. Right. Uh, controversial one. Yes. Is the Brisbane apartment market in actual recovery? Absolutely. Nothing controversial about that. That's, uh, in fact, uh, thankfully we're now hopefully coming to the end of uh, what's been a pretty prolonged period of negativity about uh, the nature of the Brisbane apartment market. It's really been a, a, a great, uh, a great um, uh, factor in revitalising the Brisbane economy. I mean, we all seem to gravitate towards the headline of, well, we've built too many apartments, there's going to be a, an apartment glut and prices are going to fall and it's the end of life as we know it, etc., etc. But uh, our good friends in the media, well, you know, we don't want to blame them. I guess we blame those that have sort of fueled those sort of ridiculous headlines. And, uh, you know, Brisbane did have a tough time three or four years ago, end of the mining boom and other factors, and it's the apartment boom that's continued to see the Brisbane economy ticking over. And uh, the news is very positive in terms of the apartment market uh, at the moment. Uh, the latest data from, uh, from my group, my housing market, shows that uh, Brisbane vacancy rates are now actually lower than Sydney's. Can you believe that? And the vacancy rate for Brisbane apartments has now fallen to that below houses. So um, it shows that that apartment market is, uh, is certainly readjusting at a rapid rate of knots. And uh, I think that when you look at, uh, I ran the median price for a, a Brisbane city one bedroom apartment yesterday, and the median asking price is just over $300,000, which is ridiculous, let me tell you. You don't get a park, car park in Sydney for that. And uh, of course, uh, you know, the gross yield on that apartment is around about 7%. 
which is again a ridiculous return given where returns are generally in Australia, not just property returns, but uh, underlying yields. And I think that that's why we're seeing, you know, a, a renewed interest, uh, not just in owner occupiers, but also investors in the Brisbane apartment market. And those yields at uh, five, six, seven percent really do scream that this is an undervalued product. And I think you'll see prices growth. We're seeing it now start to revitalise in that apartment market. And the interesting thing, of course, is that um, we've seen the peak of that boom, that uh, there's fewer apartments will be coming into the market over the next two or three years. And, uh, you know, with surging population and other factors such as uh, Airbnb soaking up existing supply, it only means that, yes, those yields will come down because prices are... Uh, prices will be rising. So you can relax, Rob. The, uh, the oversupply uh, genie is well and truly back in the bottle. Uh, it makes me actually want to buy an apartment just for that car park that you mentioned before. Yes. So uh, cheap, cheap car parks going. Guys and comes with a free apartment. Uh, next question for, for Michael. Um, why are you doing your latest development out at Ipswich? Jeez, I, the truth is I wouldn't know where to start about that. It's Queensland's fastest growing city. It's set to remain so for the next 18 years, according to the Queensland Statistician's Office. It's only half an hour to Brisbane and it's very affordable. And you can get a house and land out there, four bed, two bath, two car, still for the low 400s. And whilst there's a lot of things about Ipswich that people don't know, I find. I find as I go around talking to people about what we're doing, you can mention the words Ipswich and you can mention the word Goodna and sometimes people snarl a little bit or... Uh, I grew up on the Gold Coast in a place called Corumban and next door to me was Palm Beach and it was famous for having the largest Department of Social Security, as it was called, way back and the largest Centrelink, I think, in, in that whole region and it had a lot of drugs and a lot of crime and a lot of this kind of thing comparatively speaking and today as we speak it's three million dollars to buy an apartment on the beach there and i think the same thing matutsi came out recently and on the first of may he wrote one of his missives where he was calling ipswich uh, the next Parramatta, and it's closer to brisbane than Parramatta. there's just a the infrastructure spending out there there's just so much going on i really have to keep this short and just talk generally about it because otherwise I'd be here all day. Yeah, that, uh, South East Queensland as a region is uh, growing at a great rate of knots. Uh, so I, I think uh, South East Queensland regional plans predicted 2 million people over the next 25 years in and around the, the entire South East Queensland. So I think we're all going to benefit from that over time. So Russell, for, for yourself, as a property law specialist, if you had a, a magic wand, um, what would be the one law that you'd want to change that would make all of our lives a lot simpler? Well, I hate to say it, but it's the new one just about to be enacted on the 1st of July with the GST withholding because that's going to create an enormous amount of uncertainty and an extra burden. The biggest trap there and the biggest sting in the tail for that one is that the buyer can't rely upon the seller's uh, declarations as to whether they should withhold tax. So if the, uh, if the seller gets it wrong or falsely represents that the uh, that, an, that an amount should not be withheld the buyer is still responsible for that gst withholding tax as a penalty for the similar amount so i mean um we're already collecting the uh transfer duty we're collecting the capital gains tax and now we're collecting the gst so i mean if if we could turn the tide on the the burden of being tax collectors uh, and having the buyer being focused on as a tax collector, that would be the one thing that I would change. I think we're all in agreement with that one. Yes, <laughs> see a lot of heads nodding. Uh, Lord Mayor, back to yourself. I mentioned the South East Queensland Regional Plan a moment ago. With that 2 million people coming in over the next 25 years, the SEQRP have actually said that they're looking for a set of products called the missing middle, which is a set of products that don't necessarily exist uh, across the market in the different councils. So things like Fonzie Flats, Granny Flats, duplexes, etc. So what are some of the initiatives that Brisbane City Council are doing in that regard? Yeah, this is an interesting question, Rob, because the, the regional plan correctly predicts what our population growth will be over the coming period through to 2041. But um, equally, uh, what is important is as we have that growth, we also need to make sure we take our population with us on that journey. And uh, we've been out recently with a fairly comprehensive discussion piece with Brisbane people. Uh, it was called Plan Your Brisbane. 
Uh, we had an interaction with around um, just under a quarter of a, a, a million people in our city. We saw about 140,000 people actually give us some feedback of one form or another. And um, we've come up with this document. It's, it's a Brisbane's future blueprint. It's a reflection of what people want us to do in the coming period of time. So as we grow, uh, what are the things that people want preserved in the city to make sure our lifestyle, our livability, if you like, our character as a city is retained? Now, when we talk about the missing middle, there are certainly some opportunities uh, that are there already. So we have, for example, you can have up to 80 square metres uh, without a development application, providing it's within 20 metres of the existing dwelling. But there is the condition that it has to be occupied by a family member. Uh, I don't think we're going to see any sweeping changes in the direction that the regional plan suggests when it comes to things like Fonzie Flats or, or, or those other types of, uh, of arrangements. The people of Brisbane have spoken fairly loudly and clearly to us as a council as to how they want the city to progress. And there's 40 action points contained in this document which will be rolled out over the next, uh, next 18 months. So for any investor, I would certainly recommend that you have a look at those. Uh, some of it, um, some of it will be a change in direction. Some of it is, is a, a greater reflection on the preservation of character in the city. Um, and also uh, just in terms of suburban amenity. Um, and also things like, for example, what we, I think we have seen a little bit too much of is repeat design in townhouses and apartments, but particularly townhouses where you've, it, it looks up row after row looks the same. And what we're, we're going to be doing is setting up a design office so that you get variety within the development. So that you, you, you get a good design outcome, better than what we're getting in some developments. Um, and I, I just, um, so I just reflect on that, and, uh, but we will be true to what people of this city have told us they want us to do in terms of the way forward. But having said that, we absolutely will still be keeping up with supply, because supply is very important to the sort of thing Andrew's been talking about. We can only keep affordability in the city. You know, strong growth, yes, but still keep affordability with supply. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Dr. Wilson, yes. uh, uh, with the Gold Coast having just recently finished the uh, yeah. Commonwealth Games, uh, a lot of development happening, I guess, going into the Games, where do you see that, that market sitting right now? Well, look, there's no doubt that um, a lot of the economic energy that was, um, I guess, activated through the pre-Games period, infrastructure placement particularly, has now passed its peak. Uh, and in a way, a lot of that's now, that economic energy is shifting back into Brisbane. Um, I think that uh, you know the Gold Coast has largely been rediscovered as a uh, you know as a destination uh, because of the focus on the games. Uh, but I, look, I'm an advocate of uh, I think um, you know over the longer term that we're going to see a greater Brisbane entity start to develop, where we'll see particularly the Gold Coast and the uh, and the greater Brisbane metropolitan area as it exists now starting to merge. I think we're seeing that now, so Graham could start thinking about a broader constituency, perhaps. Uh, but uh, I think that that's part of the, the sort of the blending of the two areas, and uh, I think that that's going to be driven again by the surge in uh, demand into Brisbane itself. We'll start sort of backward trending into the Gold Coast, and um, but the Gold Coast has certainly benefited from the games as a focus. Um, investors have. Um, uh, been into that market, reactivated into that market, but uh, one of the strengths of the Gold Coast has also been its comparative value advantage over northern New South Wales markets. A lot of retirees, um, a lot of lifestylers have moved from uh, Sydney into, you know, Byron, Tweed, these environs, uh, looking for um, to cash in on their, their big value uh, uh, appreciation of their homes, and they've been locked out of that. Median house prices in Byron Bay have uh, approach to a million dollars and uh, you know then uh, of course buyers start looking at um, you know areas such as cool and gather and surface paradise as uh, being tremendously uh, prospective advantages compared to those northern New South Wales markets and I think that'll continue to attract particularly that leisure uh, and retiree uh, buyer into uh, into the Gold Coast market but of course tourism is important 
Um, and, um, you know, there's growing interest in the Gold Coast from uh, Chinese international uh, particularly. Uh, and that's reflected in the developments that are being generated there as well. So I think it's all part of the big picture that we're seeing this sort of energising of South East Queensland or re-energising of South East Queensland. And we shouldn't be surprised, really, because this is what we saw uh, during the early 2000s uh, and the mid-2000s when um, the southern capital started to run out of steam. So, uh, you know, all positive, Rob, I believe, for the Gold Coast going forward, but for greater South East Queensland. Excellent. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, next question for Michael. Uh, as a former financial planner, what are some of the uh, common mistakes that you see investors make and what advice would you give them to try and avoid them? Thanks, Rob. The, there's a lot and I guess the most common mistake I see people make is they... They, because they're familiar with something, they see it to be low risk. Whereas the markets right now, before the la after the last GFC, one of the biggest criticisms that was levelled at people in finance generally was that nobody told us and how didn't these guys know and how come the population didn't know. The fact is, right now there's, there's quite a bit of information out there talking about the next turn of the tide. But it's not making its way into the public psyche and People can't really control whether or not that happens. And I'm just not sure that the risk is actually being perceived where you've had this... Uh, Roger Montgomery put it like this recently. He said, if the average rate of return in the market is 9% per annum, and you've had, for example, financial year 2017, the return on the ASX was 18%, well, that means that next year it should be zero in order to have the average. And if you've had year after year after year where we've had returns above 9%, you've got this pent up position where you're way above the historical average. And the only way back to the average, or, or only one of two things will happen next. Either the average gets redefined as something higher than it's ever been, or history does repeat itself and we come back to the average. And things don't tend to come back nicely and sit on the average, they tend to go below. And that's the situation where we're in at the moment. The bottom of the market was March 2009. It's done more or less nothing but this ever since. And people aren't aware of that. There's a lot of complacency. And this is actually one of the things that you see in the market before a turn. It's complacency among the general population of investors. And I personally think that that is a problem. I've been worried about this now. I have to be honest, I thought it was gonna come last year. And I think I wasn't alone in that space. There was lots of people that saw it. Now, um, the Trump election probably did something for us in terms of that not happening. But at the end of the day, nobody controls whether or not it does happen. It may not happen. Certainly for me, I see a bunch of signs pointing in that direction. And I'd be interested to hear if Dr. Wilson has an opinion on all of this as well. But that's, for me right now, the main thing is that is watching out for that risk and just making sure that you don't, you're not complacent and that you're actually asking the hard questions from particularly financial advisors. Because the one thing to know is financial advisors in the main have one product and that is shares. One investment product, typically speaking. They're physically, most of them, not allowed to talk to you about property and don't really deal with alternative investments that might sit outside the share market and give you an alternative to something that is locked into this kind of cyclical environment. Thank you, Michael. Um, Andrew, did you want to retort to that? Well, look, I, I noticed that um, in regards to equities that there's been a lot of hoo-ha this week that um, we're now higher than where we were nine years ago, but uh, every other stock market in the world is about 100% higher than where they were during the GEO prior to the GSC. And uh, I, I think, you know, with all, and I'm not a financial advisor, everything's about balance, is it not? But, um, you know, the 